The title of my presentation is Machine Learning, a new ICE age, where ICE is for identification, control, and estimation. My name is Alberto Bempered, and I am from the IMT School for Advanced Studies, Luca, in Italy. Let me start with the timeline of how control evolved since the beginning of last century. Initially, it was mechanical design or using hydraulic uh, devices, but then with the advent of mathematics, and in particular complex analysis, uh, the way of designing control systems changed, and control systems were designed in the frequency domain. And you can observe similar trends happen over the years thanks to the influence of new tools. For example, linear algebra came, and then um, state space domain techniques uh, like LQR. Kalman filtering arose, then nonlinear analysis, the Puno function influenced a lot the way to design linear control systems. Semi definite programming came, and then new approaches to the analyze stability and synthesize robust control systems. Uh, came. Then system identification was heavily triggered by advances in uh, statistics, so tools from statistics injected into the control community so to develop models from data. And similarly, in optimization-based control like MPC, numerical optimization played a key role to change the way of designing um, control system by using online optimization. Now machine learning it's, has got very popular. And uh, probably it's going to have another uh, impact in the way we design control systems. And I can see the main trends now in R&D, in controls in industry are MPC and machine learning. Why MPC? MPC has a long history of success in the process industries. Uh, starting in the 80s, there have been thousands of applications successfully uh, implemented in process control, and now it's spreading also in other industries like the automotive uh, industry. The reason why it's successful is because it's quite a universal control technique and can handle multivariable systems with an arbitrary number of inputs and outputs. Um, you can use linear models or nonlinear models or even stochastic models. The philosophy, the control philosophy will be the same. And in particular, it's able to handle constraints on input and output variables. It's rather intuitive to design and to calibrate and also to reconfigure. If your process changes, then probably you just have to revise the models and the same setup that you have uh, could be already a good, very good starting point for the new uh, controller that you want to design after the plant has changed. One reason of success is also that there are good tools, uh, software tools to assist in the design and in the uh, deployment of MPC controllers. Let me just mention the MPC toolbox for MATLAB, distributed by the MATWORKS. These are tools that I've been involved with. And also a commercial tool um, distributed by ODIS uh, is an embedded MPC toolset for linear and nonlinear MPC control and is mainly uh, tailored to industrial fast sampling applications like those that you find in the automotive industry. Let me just mention that uh, an engine controller designed by General Motors and Audis uh, has been now in production since the end of 2018. And as far as we know, uh, this is the first mass production, at least documented mass production of uh, an MPC controller based on online optimization, online quadratic programming, running on the electronic control module of the vehicle that is in mass uh, production in the automotive industry. Now, why machine learning? In a nutshell, you can say that machine learning um, is a set of techniques for extracting mathematical models from data that you can use for classification, for prediction, or for decision making. It has very good mathematical foundations from artificial intelligence, uh, statistics, and optimization. And uh, most important, it works really well in uh, practice, in spite of the fact that training is usually done by uh, solving non-convex, non-linear programming problem, use, often using very simple optimization um, algorithms for convex optimization. It is using myriads, really myriads of uh, uh, applications, even beyond traditional engineering that control um, systems are usually looking at. And uh, one reason of success, uh, I think, is also, again, due to the availability of excellent software tools for training 
um, training, uh, for example, neural networks. Let me just mention the, the basics uh, she could learn in Python or Keras, Keras TensorFlow and PyTorch and others that are on the public domain, open source, you can use them and they work also really, really well. So what can machine learning do for MPC? Well, it can help in the identification process, so how to learn good prediction models from data that can be used in MPC. It can be used for learning directly the control uh, low from data or to calibrate the control low automatically or semi-automatically from data. And also it can help designing uh, state observers and estimators for closing the loop. So typically an MPC controller, um, given the process that you want to control, it has certain outputs that you want to track certain set points. Uh, MPC addresses the control problem by using a prediction model of the process you're controlling and an optimization algorithm that solve online an optimal control problem that depends on the current state as an initial condition and need, this needs to be provided by a state observer. So the three blocks here that you see can be improved by using uh, machine learning or can, you can even change the design philosophy using machine learning tools. This is the outline of my presentation. I will first review identification methods based on machine learning, in particular a technique based on autoencoders to learn state space and linear models from data, and uh, also another technique to learn the entire MPC prediction uh, from data to use in the MPC optimization. Then I will review two approaches in uh, synthesis of control, uh, a reinforcement learning method, in particular a direct policy search method to learn control load from data, and then techniques for automatic um, tuning of MPC uh, control parameters from data. And then finally, uh, talk about some techniques for estimation of uh, unmeasured signals uh, from, uh, from data, so how to synthesize virtual sensors and state observers from data. So let me start with uh, learning prediction models from data. So modeling is usually the biggest effort in MPC design. Often you want to rely on physics-based nonlinear models if you have an insight of the physics underlying the process you are controlling. Uh, often the physics is too complex or too nonlinear to, uh, to be used in an MPC setting. And therefore, you can resort to black box system identification, so collect data from the process and then fit a linear or a linear model to this data. In general, pure black box uh, is difficult, so often you have a mix of physics based and uh, black box, which is, which is gray box modeling, where you use the physics to model parts of the system or even just to understand what is the relation between input and output signals to uh, define the black box model structure. Now, when you use models in MPC, uh, if those are nonlinear models, you need to use also Jacobians. Um, either if you use a linear MPC, you need to linearize the nonlinear dynamics around nominal, uh, nominal uh, trajectories, or if you use nonlinear optimization, you still need Jacobians if you want to uh, optimize efficiently. And it's important to remember in MPC that the final complexity of the controller depends on the complexity of the model. So when you design a model of the process to be used in MPC, you have to remember that this should be simple enough not to complicate too much the online optimization. So you always have this trade-off between describing the dynamics but keep the model simple to keep MPC computation simple. So an approach that we took with Daniele uh, Massi recently to um, learn state space models from data is to resort a technique to a technique in machine learning that is called autoencoders. So let me just mention how this works. So an autoencoder is basically um, a neural network that uh, is trained to reproduce the same uh, input okay, on the output. So let's say this started in image processing, say you have an image, you want to train a network that whose output is as much as you can similar to the input image. Why you want to do this? What, so why you want to train the identity function, basically? Well, because the structure of the network has um, a hourglass type of shape, so the 
inner layers of the network become thinner and thinner, so with fewer and fewer nodes. And uh, the central layer is, uh, is kind of a compression of the image. So it captures features from the image. Okay, then you can use in the upper part of the network to decode those en en encapsulation of the information and reproduce the original image. Okay, so with this idea in mind, we consider this problem. So let's say you have input and output data collected. Now let's form these two vectors. One is the vector of past NA outputs and past NB inputs, as you typically do in the uh, regression of uh, autoregressive models. Okay, so let's fix the model order and A and B. And then you consider a, a vector on the output of past M outputs where M is the smallest between NA and B or even smaller. Okay, so rather than reproducing the whole past inputs and outputs, which will be the whole uh, collected um, samples, past NA plus NB samples, we just focus on reproducing the past output samples. So the input to the network will be past uh, outputs and inputs, and the output will be past outputs. And in an inner layer, where you have the fewest number of uh, neurons, you will have a state vector, okay? So let's call xk the values in the inner layer. Now let's duplicate the network. Let's feed a copy of the network with now a shifted version of past input and outputs, okay? So here we have ik minus one, here we have ik, so one step shifted version, and here we reproduce OK plus one, so the shifted version of the outputs. So that here we reproduce XK plus one. Now we can introduce another network that models the state uh, transition from XK to XK plus one. So what we fit then is a model by penalizing the difference between the um, recorded output and the output produced by the network, okay, at time K and also the shifted version, okay? And uh, also the difference between the uh, states reproduced by the network and the states reproduced by the uh, state update function F, okay? So the structure of the network we are training will have an encoder, okay? So the function, the first part of the network that encodes past input and outputs into the state vector, let's call this E. This actually acts as a dead bit observer because it maps past inputs and outputs into the current state. Then the rest of the network will be the output map. So the way we decode from XK to past uh, current and past outputs. So in particular, the current output is part of this function. Okay, and the state uh, transition map. Now, if you want, this is the basic setup. You can do modifications on these. For example, you can use groups, uh, group lasso terms to sparsify the, um, the solution, so to decrease the number of weights you have in the network, so to get a simpler model. And you can also give special structures to the function. For example, you can directly uh, identify a quasi-LPV structure by setting F as a, a, a matrix A whose uh, coefficients are fit for neural networks. Okay, so that it's quasi linear with respect to the state, uh, affine with respect to the state and the input, and the same for the output function. Now, how to build a state observer out of this model? Here you have a few options. Uh, again, directly use the uh, encoder mapping. This, however, may be sensitive to noise, so you can design an extended Kalman filter based on the obtained uh, model F and uh, the, the decoder. Okay, or you can even simultaneously fit a state observer. So you can introduce another function, S, which could be another neural network that maps current estimated state, XK, UK, YK, into the next estimated uh, state for step K plus one, okay? With an additional loss penalizing the difference between state reconstructed by the network and the state reconstructed by the observer so that you synthesize simultaneously the model and the associated state observer. Let me show an example. So let's take a simple nonlinear two tank benchmark problem. It's a nonlinear process. We have designed throughout encoders uh, a model. So we have trained a model with three hidden layers of so quite a simple model with 60 exponential linear unit 
neurons. And uh, uh, we have compared the approach to nonlinear autoregressive uh, auto models identification, and actually it turns out that this approach, it provides better fitting results. And you can also obtain directly the Jacobians from the identified neural networks for use in MPC. And what you see here in the picture are LTV MPC results, so linear MPC obtained by solving one quadratic programming problem at each step based on the linearized um, neural model. Let me mention another approach that actually is described in this paper at the conference uh, by, again, Daniele Masti, as my head of and myself. So here we took a different approach and say, let's try to learn the entire prediction. So let's not learn a recursive model, but directly learn the whole, uh, the whole predicted outputs, okay? Uh, of course, we exploit causality, so we know the system is causal, so the functions that we identify for the predicted output at time k plus 1, k plus 2, and k plus n uh, as a triangular structure because it depends on the outputs, let's say, at time 2, only depends on the state x0 and the inputs u0, u1. And uh, then after you get the model train, you can use directly the linearized version of the model to design a linear MPC controller. So let's say u bar 0, u bar 1, and so on, is the nominal trajectory you're linearizing around, for example, the previous optimal trajectory obtained by MPC shifted one step ahead. And you can even give a structure to the prediction model that you use. For example, you can say that predicted output is a function of the initial state and the nominal inputs, okay? Uh, plus another function, these two can be neural networks, for example, plus another function that multiplies the difference, directly the difference between the inputs and the nominal inputs, so that you can directly then plug this model into the MPC constructor and it's already a linear model, you don't need to linearize. Now, here are some uh, results. Um, so if you apply the affine neural predictor to the same benchmark problem, here with uh, 10,000 training samples and the neural network with two layers and 20 ReLU neurons. If you look at the fit, okay, so the difference between the predicted output and the measured output, um, of course this gets worse and worse as the prediction step increases, but it's, it's pretty good. And here you see results obtained by closing the loop. So the controller synthesized in this way is able to track the reference signal quite, quite well. Now let's see an approach instead of on, uh, for getting the controller directly from, from data. So it is described in, in this paper here with Laura Ferrarotti and we have an extension also, also the IFA conference I will mention later. So here, we model the system generating the data, so the process we want to control as a, as a, as a process whose state is ST, actually the state ST collects the states of the process and possibly the environment around the process. And we don't know this model, okay? Uh, there are inputs affecting the, the process. These are our manipulative variables. Uh, there might be disturbances affecting the, the process, and there might be also um, measured disturbances or reference signals that affect the evolution of the, of the system, okay? So S could contain also states of a control uh, parameterization that we want to train. So the control policy will then be a function that we need to um, train from data of the current state and current vector P of parameters entering the, the, um, the control law. As a performance index for uh, learning the control law, we use um, a performance index, which is uh, an infinite horizon cost. Rho is a stage cost that uh, is, a, is a penalty on states, uh, for example, deviation of the output from a reference signal and uh, input effort, and this is summed up over an infinite horizon. Now, this depends on uh, disturbances and initial states. 
So you should minimize the expectation with respect to all possible initial states, disturbances, and uh, external variables p, okay, of this uh, figure. So minimize the expected performance. Now this problem is not directly really tractable, so you can do some simplifications. First, you can parameterize the control law with the final set of uh, parameters. Let's call K the matrix collecting the parameters of the control law. And then you can look at the finite horizon only. So rather than to an infinite horizon, uh, restrict your performance evaluation over an horizon of L steps. So now we can use stochastic gradient descent to um, update the parameters of the control policy by taking the gradients of the uh, cost that we are optimizing as a function of the parameters k of the control law. And uh, this is a descent direction, so is related to the gradient of this function. Now to compute the gradient of this function, we need to, um, to have a local model of the dynamics because to um, predict over L steps the effect of a policy, we need to have a model. And uh, we only use the gradient of this function, so actually we don't need the function, we need to compute this gradient. And in order to compute the gradient, it's enough to have a local linear model of the process, okay, that is used to compute the, the gradient that we need in the stochastic gradient descent. And we've done this using recursive linear system identification. So this is not really totally model-free approach, but at the same time, you don't need to come up with a full open loop model of the process up front to design the controller. You just estimate local linear models just for computing the gradients of the, of the cost that you want to optimize while training the control law. Okay, you can look at this as a mini batch um, stochastic gradient descent algorithm applied to uh, optimizing the policy where you collect a certain number of uh, samples of the initial state, of the reference signal more general of the p-parameter, and of the disturbance signal. Okay, so you enumerate certain samples, form this gradient, and then do a gradient step. So the policy will then work as follows. So you get the current state, you recursively update the local linear models that you need to compute the gradients, estimate the gradient, and so compute the direction of descent, and then update the parameters of the control policy. You can do this offline to train the policy or you can even do this online. Now as, um, if you do this online, as applying directly a policy, uh, especially at the early stage of training directly on the process, the, the policy can be very badly tuned. So at least you can impose a, a stabilization constraint so you can impose that the policy you are actually applying to excite the process um, is stable with respect to, so asymptotically stabilize at least the linear model that you are currently at. And note that here, exploration is guaranteed by the reference signal, in general by the external parameter signal PT that you provide to the system. So that's a way you can explore the, the space of, of states by perturbing the reference signal and the policy depends on the reference signal so the policy will generate inputs that move the state uh, to visit the region of operation of your, of your system. So let's consider a special case for designing this controller which is uh, output uh, to solve output tracking problems. So the stage cause is simply the difference between uh, the output and the reference signal, uh, the input increments, and also we introduce uh, an integral of the tracking error to enforce offset-free tracking properties. So this will be additional states that we include in the, the control policy and therefore in the model, okay? And uh, let's train just a linear policy first. So let's parameterize a policy as a two degree of freedom linear feedback on the state and the reference signal. Okay, so if you do the training, this is the model generating the data, so it's a linear model that we use for testing the approach. Uh, you can see that with the data provided from the model, you can uh, design pretty good uh, controller that can track the reference signal quite, quite well. This is done in the absence of disturbances. And here you can see how the um, controller coefficients 
uh, evolve over um, iterations. And actually, they converge to the optimal model-based control policy for the system that, that we use to generate the data. So you're covering the LQR controller using stochastic gradient descent. And here is another example, is a continuously, continuously steer tank mm. reactor problem that you have, you want to control. So it's a nonlinear, it's described by nonlinear dynamics. Uh, here with stochastic gradient descent, you train a linear controller that can do tracking quite well, even for a large uh, range of outputs. What if you do model-based design using the more standard approach of doing first a linear model based on the data you have and then design an LQR controller based on the linear model, or actually you're doing worse, and um, the optimal controller you get, it performs worse than the controller that we have designed with stochastic gradient descent. And the reason is that, um, at least the intuition is that when you do system identification, you don't care about performance. You just care about fitting the output prediction as best as you can. Let's consider now the problem of learning the optimal parameters of an MPC controller. An MPC controller depends on different tuning knobs like the weights using the cost function, the prediction and control horizon, even the covariance matrices using the Kalman filter, they use in combination with MPC, and the tolerances you use in the numerical solver for online optimization. So you can define a performance index, okay? For example, look at the sum of the tracking errors over a certain simulation horizon or over a duration of an experiment, and then attempt minimizing this function okay, uh, with respect to the MPC parameters. Now, this in general is a non-convex, non-linear programming problem that you want to solve to global optimality. What are good methods to solve this problem? Um, you cannot use derivatives, especially if the function comes from an experiment, it's, uh, it's impossible to do uh, perturbations to compute final differences. Uh, you want to find a global optimizer, so you shouldn't get stuck in local minima. And also you want to minimize the number of function evaluations that you make. Each function evaluation might require a new experiment to make and therefore can be time consuming and costly. There are different methods available uh, for solving such derivative uh, free non-convex optimization problems. Uh, Rios and Saidinis had an excellent survey paper done reviewing um, these methods, I list a bunch of them here on this slide. And I recently developed a new method called GLIS for global optimization using inverse distance weighting and radial basis function surrogates. You can download the Python and the MATLAB version of the solver from this web page. So we have applied this uh, method GLIS to a calibration problem. Um, in MPC. Uh, the problem is described in this paper, which uh, appears at this conference. So we apply a linear MPC uh, controller to a cart pole system where we control the force and um, want to control the, the angle and the position of the cart uh, by applying linear MPC. So this is a close uh, loop performance score function we look at. So penalty on tracking the reference position and also penalty on the uh, angle uh, phi of the card, of the pendulum. Um, MPC parameters are tuned uh, using GLIS in 500 iterations. Now here we have 14 parameters. These are the sampling time we want to use, the weights on the outputs and input increments, the prediction and control horizon, the covariance matrices on the Kalman filter, and the absolute and relative tolerances of the QP solvers. So we keep all of these parameters as three degrees uh, of freedom to optimize and then optimize them by looking at close to performance. And here is what you will get. Actually, we consider two different configurations. One um, is an MPC controller running on the desktop. Uh, computer one on a Raspberry Pi. So performance is measured experimentally, okay? So the cart is simulated by, but the MPC controller is run on the platform, okay? And you will get different results. For example, with the desktop um, setting, the optimal sampling time would be six milliseconds, okay? While for the Raspberry Pi, with the optimal sample time would be 22 milliseconds, and this will be a trade-off between the 
performance you observe, so the longer the sampling time, then the worse will be the closed loop performance, you're less reactive. On the other hand, you have less time to compute the, the, the solution if the sampling time is small. So it's all the trade-off between these 14 parameters. And you can say that this global optimization used to self-calibrate the, the controller uh, is trying to squeeze in the maximum performance you get uh, given the control hardware that you have available. And with Bayesian optimization, you get similar results, although with larger computation effort to optimize the parameter, set of parameters. So pros and cons of uh, uh, auto calibration. Um, the pros is that the selection is purely automatic. It's applicable to any calibration parameter, and you can define arbitrary performance indexes. Okay? It doesn't have to be related to the MPC performance index that you use in the controller. It can be an arbitrary function. The cons of this approach is that you need to quantify an objective function, and sometimes this is not easy, especially if you have multiple objectives. You need to decide how to blend these different multi-objective uh, multi functions. And also often you, you don't have a quantitative way of uh, expressing the function, so you, you have some qualitative aspect that you want to use in judging close loop performance. That's why we developed a new approach recently. It's called GLISP. It's a preference-based optimization approach. So you are solving the global optimization problem, not by sampling the function, but by querying a user of uh, what is best between two different alternatives, and then propose new and new alternatives to judge to, uh, to the calibrator in this case, okay? And this will be um, presented in um, this paper by Meng Jiu and uh, myself and Daniel Piga. Now regarding estimation. So what we want to solve is a problem of uh, reconstructing unmeasured variables from uh, measured signals. So you can consider that the system generating the data is an nonlinear system that depends on a vector uh, row of parameters. This could be, for example, a parameter varying nonlinear system, or row can be uh, internal variables of the system. Okay. So you want to estimate the signal row by measuring the output. Uh, typically, you want to use this to model. Um, changes in the system, for example, due to wear of components or drift of some parameters of the components, or even to fall, something changes in the system. You cannot measure this directly, but you can try to reconstruct from output data. So linear parameter varying systems are a special case, as well as switch defined systems are also a special case where a row can only take a finite uh, set of values. Okay, so the assumptions here are that we cannot measure row at runtime. We have row available from the training data set. Okay, so that's typically in virtual sensor uh, training. You know offline what is the quantity. You can measure the quantity that you later will not know, and you use this data for training the virtual uh, sensor. And uh, we don't know the model. Okay, so we cannot use a model-based approach like, for example, extended common filtering to synthesize the observer because we don't have a model of the system. Okay, so um, how do we proceed? So here is an approach that we introduced with Daniele Massi and Daniele Bernardini recently. So let's collect the data set and uh, let's estimate a local linear model, okay, by using recursive system identification. So this will give us... Uh, a vector gamma of coefficients for each time uh, index in the data set. And then we can use unsupervised learning, in particular k-means, to structure, to get a structure in the space of uh, parameters A and B of the model. So we partition this set of gamma parameters into k uh, clusters, okay? And uh, then we identify for each of this cluster, clusters a local linear model. So a lo linear model that is good on average on, on the cluster, okay? So we go back to the data points corresponding to points in the cluster and fit a linear model there. Why we fit a linear model? Because then we design a linear observer based on the centroidal linear model. Why doing this? 
we use the observers as a way of uh, compressing data. So the observer tries to estimate the, uh, a certain information vector, which could be, say, the state of, uh, of the linear model we have identified. Okay. Uh, these numbers nu here are, uh, say, features. So, for example, the sum of the output estimation errors over a past horizon of L um, steps. And with these extra features, we can now train um, a predictor. Okay, so train a function that um, can reconstruct the feature vector from the input and output signals and from these extra signals generated by the observer, okay? And then a prediction function, G, that gives rho as a function of uh, the information vector I, K. Now, G here can be an artificial neural network um, or it could be a decision tree or a random forest. Our training objective overall is to match the measured row with the estimated row. And let me show an example. So here we consider a um, nonlinear parameter varying system. Okay, so if alpha is different than zero, here we have a nonlinear term. The system will be linear if alpha is zero. Okay, and row enters here in the, in the multiplying the B matrix. Okay, and also enters here the output equation. So let's excite the system <clears throat> with some random input signal and um, let's generate the scheduling signal um, rho k with um, stochastic process. So uh, rho evolves uh, with um, a random perturbation, okay? So p is this uh, um, combination of the current rho and the uh, new perturbation and then you either assign rho k plus one equal pk if you are within minus plus minus point uh, 95 or you halve the quantity if you are outside this range. Okay, so we assume that all measurements are affected by uh, noise, okay? input, output, and row measurements. And uh, we collect the training data set up to 25,000 samples and keep 5,000 samples for testing. So let's use uh, local models um, defined by a recursive other regressive uh, estimator based on common filtering. Uh, we use three past inputs and past uh, outputs for, for getting local models. And uh, then we run um, k-means with n clusters. We will try different ends. And uh, then design a dead bit observer for each of the centroidal models that we get for each cluster. Now, the input to the artificial neural networks that we train is the information vector that collects u, y, and the n features, <clears throat> where the features are the sum over the past four steps of the output prediction errors. We use an artificial neural network with two rectifier linear unit um, layers, which is a total of six, 64 neurons plus a linear output function. And as an alternative, we also use a decision tree and a random forest with the maximum depth of 10 nodes each. Okay, so if we're going to construct the uh, signal, so we measure the quality of fit, so rho minus the estimated rho, normalize rho bar is the uh, mean value of rho over this experiment. These are the results obtained by using seven uh, models. Okay, so you can see that the predicted rho matches uh, pretty well the uh, true one. Okay, and um, so here are some fitting results uh, with the standard deviation. So we run the same experiment uh, 10 times with different realizations. And uh, you can see there is a consistent fit uh, ranging between around 0.68 uh, with two models, and then it quickly gets up to around 0.78 as we increase the number of, of models. This is done using the random forest predictor. With the neural network and the decision tree results are, are similar. Okay, so with five models, you will get similar fit 
Okay, slightly better with the random forest, more or less similar with the neural network. And of course, if you decrease the number of training samples, the quality of fit decreases. But also, you can see from here that with more than 25 samples, probably you're going to get a similar um, quality of fit. And we can use the same technique for reconstructing the mode in the switching linear system. So if we set alpha equals zero, the system becomes a switching linear system. We assume rho can only take uh, four values, okay? And here you see how the mode is reconstructed, okay, from the approach. And these are normalized signals. You can see that uh, the mode is reconstructed quite accurately. Uh, there are some glitches here and there, but know that there is no penalty on uh, the switching uh, between two different consecutive steps, okay? Here is another example where we want to use this approach for state estimation in a nonlinear system. So we consider a lithium ion battery model. This model is unknown, it's only used for generating the, the data. Uh, we assume we can only measure the output voltage and the current I to the battery, and we want to estimate the state of charge on the battery, which is X1. So here, what you see here is um, how we are able to reconstruct the state of charge. So the blue one is the predicted, the orange one is the true one. And here we compare with the extended Kalman filters that uh, with different covariance matrices. So results are comparable, but know that with extended Kalman filtering, you will need a model of the system, while here with this approach, we are not using a model of the system, okay? And by the way, the time uh, spent for evaluating the observer is really, really small because the, um, the function that we train, either a neural network or decision tree or a random forest, these are relatively compact and quite fast to, to evaluate. So these are not complex uh, functions to implement online. So to conclude, MPC and machine learning are a good combination of uh, technologies, I would say, um, and I think they will have definitely have an impact in the design and implementation of uh, advanced nonlinear control systems in practice. Uh, MPC is a powerful um, control technology based on online optimization, and machine learning can be really helpful in getting control-oriented models from data and also to approximate the uh, MPC control law, so to simplify the MPC control law, or even to uh, calibrate the control law directly from data, so to speed up the calibration process, or even to replace online optimization with um, some, some nonlinear maps. I think ignoring machine learning would be uh, a mistake. So it's a powerful technology that we uh, should, uh, I think should use to improve our uh, control design uh, approaches. I think we have to learn a lot from machine learning. There are very good ideas there that we can get and uh, use and uh, probably invent new ones uh, for uh, designing control systems. At the same time, I don't think machine learning alone is enough there, sometimes you feel this tendency, hey, let's do everything with machine learning, like just train a controller from data using the neural network and uh, hope it works. My experience is that uh, black box, pure black box modeling uh, can be a failure because you have too many degrees of freedom in choosing the, the model structure. So you can spend a lot of time in training models and actually the results may not be satisfactory while if you introduce some insights about the physics of the system or at least the structure of the system, you can be much more effective. So gray box modeling is usually much more effective in the end and also simpler to, um, to design a model. And also approximating the control law with a, with a function by function, pure function regression can also be um, a failure. So we have excellent online optimization tools that we can use so probably we should keep using online optimization, maybe over simplified models, model simplified using machine learning ideas, but uh, we, I would not abandon the power of online optimization in handling constraints uh, properly and in optimizing online performance. Okay, this concludes my talk, thanks.